other e-book products and e-audiobook products, which includes Alina from New West, yes. um, <laughs> from yeah. who's logging in right now. <coughs> We've got Jennifer from Surrey, and I will be covering off a couple of extra ones. And if Anita from <coughs> Burnaby is hiding in the back, if you want to wander up here, um, and I might call and tell someone from the audience, just as a pre-warning, um, if anyone here has EBSCO eBooks, raise your hand now. Wow, either not admitting to it, or uh, <laughs> subscribe to EBSCO eBooks, okay, that we're safe. Uh, no one has to uh, talk from their chairs. Uh, you ready? Hi everyone, yes, I'll be um, talking about Freeding. Freeding is offered by Library Ideas, the same company that offers um, FreeGal and the Rocket Languages. Um, it's a product that we've had for almost three years. Um, the way it works um, is a system that, like, it uses a system based on tokens, like a virtual currency that people use to download content. So what you can see here in the corner of, like, left top corner of each book is the, the number of tokens that people would pay when downloading that particular title. Um, our library has set a limit of five tokens per week, and they roll up, and people can get up to 20 tokens, like they add up for four weeks. So basically, when you download a title that costs two tokens, then you have only three left for that week. Um, in terms of um, content, so this is the, the great thing about um, Freeding is that the titles are always available. So no holds, simultaneous access. Um, in terms of content, um, the collection, uh, the number of titles available is impressive, 53,000. Um, over, they cover over 1,100 publishers, but not the big ones. So that's the difference in comparison with Overdrive. Um, however, there are a few um, publishers like Capstone, Hardcore, Open Media, Open Road Media, uh, Skyhorse, Skyhorse Publishing, Sourcebooks, or Workman, like some of the um, well-known ones, but not, uh, like I said, the big, the big names that we see in Overdrive. Um, new titles are purchased on a regular basis, so we've seen the collection growing over time. Um, it covers uh, most of the titles offered are non-fiction. It's a great source for travel guides. Um, they have a mobile app um, that works similar with the Overdrive app. Um, so people just log in, they use their um, library card uh, number and PIN, and then um, they have to be authorized um, for using the card. They have to, to have an Adobe Digital um, ID. Um, so there aren't any platform fees, uh, free mark records are available. Um, there are two flexible payment options. So one is a subscription and the other one is pay as you go option. This is what we have, pay as you go. So basically the price is 50 cents per token. Um, so, and that's, that has worked for us very well. Um, and the renewals are cheaper. So for example, if I download the title that costs um, two tokens and if I want to renew the title, then if the price would drop to one or even zero token, so it would be cheaper for for us. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions or if you can. Yeah, okay. That's about it. Always available titles. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we're going to swap over to the talk is now. Hi everyone, I'm Anita Chan, I'm the new web coordinator at Burnley Public Library. So I'm going to talk about uh, Safari Books. For those of you who don't know, it's um, a collection of mostly technical books. So the content that they offer is computers, software development, web design, web development, um, <coughs> digital arts, photography, there's some math, uh, engineering, applied uh, sciences. So it's pretty cool. There's a collection of uh, about 38,000 titles and Burnaby has about 31,000 um, titles in their collection. So the neat thing about Safari is that they include lots of video content with your books. So if you're learning how to use an Adobe product, for example, there might be a, a video component attached that will show you how to um, work through a, a module. So it's really neat. You can do a keyword search and search for the, the videos and the books at the same time. It's got all the big name publishers in the tech industry, so O'Reilly, for example, uh, Wiley, as in Wesley, McGraw-Hill, um, Adobe Press, Microsoft Press. Um, the access right now is um, in the library or the an IP uh, range from home or through Easy Proxy. So it's compatible with normal devices. Um, it requires continuous access to the internet. There's an app available, but we don't actually really um, 
I don't know if a lot of my patrons use that. They do offer free mark records, which is awesome. Um, we've noticed that most of our, our access is through the catalog, uh, not through the, the Safari portal. It's getting a lot of use, and, and we think it's because we do have a lot of tech industries in Burnaby, like Electronic Arts is there, and BCIT has you know that um, a lot of programs. So it's, it's being served well, not necessarily by Burnaby residents, but by a lot of people who work in Burnaby, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, some product features, uh, some pros. You can print or email individual pages. You can create unique URLs for each page. There's a table of contents. You can search the book, search a chapter. Good help documentation. Um, so there's some cons. Uh, there's no offline access. So I, I think this is the same with something like 24 7 books. Um, you can't. Uh, you can't download like whole sections or chapters, which is kind of frustrating. Um, there's no citations, but you can always use the URL. There's a unique identifier for each page to go to a specific uh, section. There's no bookmarking or wish lists. Um, you can't rate or view social media components. Um, the one big technical drawback is that it times out after a certain period of inactivity, which is kind of funny because when you're reading a book on your browser, you're not really moving, you're not really touching anything. And if you don't do anything in 20 minutes, your session ends. And um, it's a really easy fix. You just close your browser and start over again, but it's a known issue. We have four concurrent user licenses right now. Um, we've been getting a lot of turnaways at Burnaby, so it's definitely something um, we're gonna think about adding a new license. It's, it's under consideration. Um, we're getting, these are old stats from 2014. Uh, we were getting about 2,300 users or um, sessions um, for that year. I'm gonna say it dropped a little bit more about 2,100 users, 2,100 users. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions? So I guess you probably realize that it's recorded books, they're tied in with Zidio. Um, it's the same thing. There's no notification that you're on a US server. They collect email addresses, they collect name, first name, last name, and for some reason they collect a postal code, and I'm not really mm -hmm. sure why. Um, I am gonna talk to them when I'm at ALA about the privacy stuff, and actually I can bring, if anybody else is going to ALA, we can talk before, or I can bring some questions to them. Their app, the iPad app performs terribly. Um, sorry, one, sorry, one click. It's terrible, <laughs> it's just it's glitchy. The Android app is fantastic. That's another thing I'm gonna to talk to them about. They have a one-click digital media manager that you can download and put on your desktop. And um, a lot of the titles are not protected. And strangely enough, you can actually search by not protected titles, which is great because then you can transfer them to any device. So I would say the majority of them are protected. Um, let's see. The help is pretty good. They provide patron help. 
unlike overdrive you can just email them and the, eventually they will answer your question um, they respond quite quickly to me when I email them because they know that I'm a purchaser um, they don't respond as quickly to patrons we've noticed you can reset your password in the app which is oh not in the app that's the other thing you cannot reset your password in the app but you can reset it through um, desktop does anyone have any questions I promise I won't crumble if you ask them. <laughs> Oh, and sorry. I have a question, but I have a comment, and I promise that I'll pitch you if I use something that you didn't mention. It's the fact that you can change, the library administrator has the option to change the, the, the books that display on top of the page, which is something different than other services. So you basically, as an admin, have the option to go in and decide what books you want advertised on top of the page. Right. Yeah, it's actually, the admin interface is pretty good, I think. And you can run your own reports. You can separate out your items from the consortial items. Okay, one quick last thing in the ebook section, and then we're going to move on to uh, e video. And I apologize ahead of time for taking up extra time for this section. Um, so, the other product, I don't know if anyone's had the demo from Biblio Board. Um, heard of Biblio Board? They're, well, Lori has, I have. Uh, they're a very small company out of uh, North Carolina. They do a lot of non-fiction, um, always available ebook packages, and they really market themselves. I feel like almost they're more of a school product. So they'll market like U.S. history bundles. You can get presidents bundles of ebook content. But also uh, the way they have it set up is that um, libraries can set up their own bundles of content of what they have available. Um, it is fairly interesting. They're very eager to, I think, break into markets outside of their small geographic area. Uh, they're very nice to talk to, and they're also the partner and the platform that uh, runs through Library Journal's Self-E program, um, which is the uh, self-published ebook platform. So that runs off of BiblioBoard, and that's a platform around um, where authors sort of donate a copy of the book if they have to make sure they have the rights in order to do that so that it's self-published authors only and um, library patrons then have access to those um, titles forever and that's <coughs> very nice it's perpetual again um, and simultaneous use um, and if we want to talk more about self-published ebooks that will be one of the breakout sessions mm -hmm. once we're finished with the rest of the content anything i missed on the high points Lori? No, just that they don't have any of the big five no. publishers, so they would be like as a, a sort of a complimentary kind of platform for yeah. some of their They're Yes, it's all very small, almost entirely nonfiction, <laughs> except for public domain ebooks that everyone has access to. So that wraps up our um, ebook section. The e video speakers may just you today. Just see uh, Jennifer O'Donnell from Northern Fan District and talk to us about video. Hi everybody, I'm going to try to shorten down what I plan to present so that we can keep on time and have time for everything. So if I miss anything, feel free to ask questions or pop in afterwards. I'm going to be talking about three of the main online video features, uh, services that are out there, IndieFlix, Overdrive, and Kupla. IndieFlix is with RB Digital and it is I believe going to be, my understanding is that it's going to be included with the new Zinio license. So it's, it is a set annual fee with unlimited use within that fee, that, that, as far as I know of, and it will be included with the Zinio. There are about 6,500 films. It focuses on award-winning shorts, feature films, and documentaries. I, you can, you can, you can, it's only available by streaming, so you cannot download the content, but you can stream it either in the app or in the browser. I've had not success with using it in the app, so it's a bit hit or miss, but I, apparently it works. North Bend City's had it for a year, and their experience has been that it hasn't had a lot of uptake, although they admit that they haven't promoted it. So it's sort of, there's a lot of really good content in there. You can search by language. There are about 50 or 60 languages. You can search by country. You can search by the uh, award, the, the film festival that it was at. And so there's a lot of, of good content in there. 
Overdrive is offering videos now. Uh, benefit of the Overdrive videos are that you can watch them in the app that you're using. So you can watch them in the app, which is useful. Again, they've got about 12,000 films in, in 50 or 60 languages, although of the 12,000 films available, about 11,000 of them are English. So the majority is English content, but there is other content available. You can watch them, again, in the Overdrive app or in the browser, and again, you can only stream them, so there's no way to access the content in, in a downloaded form with, with Overdrive. The cost for the Overdrive videos, they seem to have two pricing models. You can either have pay for, pay for a content and have it for a specified period of time. I think I'm seeing 72 months as a common time frame, so I believe you get unlimited use for 72 months, and then after that, you don't get access. They also have a cost per circ model, and the cost per circ could be anywhere from what I saw from about $1.20 to $4.49. They also have packages where you can get unlimited use, so that you purchase a particular type of content and you get unlimited access to that for your patrons. And that ranges from about, I think, nine to about $20,000, depending on the package that you choose. Again, it's only available from streaming. And that's kind of the overdrive in a really quick nutshell. I'm really doing this trying to hit the 10 o'clock mark. <laughs> Hoopla. <laughs> Do I have, no, I've got 10, okay, so I've got a bit more time. So Hoopla is the, is the service with which I'm most familiar. North Fence District launched it about this time last year. It has films, music, albums, audiobooks, and television shows, and it just recently added ebooks and comic books. Although, from what I can tell, I don't think anybody in th that I know has actually gone moved forward with the ebooks and comic books. It is a cost per circ model, so you're paying for every time people are using it, and the cost per circ ranges mm -hmm. from $1.29 to $3.99. You do have the option, in terms of managing it, to set a price cap either for um, how what the, what the maximum cost per circ is you're willing to use, or you can set the maximum number of SERPs per patron. So you can say, and those range across the province from five, six, 10, I think 12 is the most that I've seen. Uh, and so that your patrons at the beginning of the month would get a certain number of SERPs. You can stream it on your computer or in the app, and you can also download it in the app, which means that people can access the content offline. The, there's a lot of content there. It's got about 6,000 films, about 225,000 uh, 2, albums, um, about 7,500 7, audiobooks, and then the ebooks and comic books have just launched. It does have other languages, but it's not as, it, it's, it's mostly English content, and it tends to be mostly older content. Um, in terms of managing Hoopla, my experience has been, so it is that, and, and from what I've heard from other libraries, is you either say we're going to just have unlimited use and we're just going to let people, we're not going to worry about the budget too much. I don't quite understand people who have that <laughs> capability <laughs> because that is not my reality. But I, I talked to a number of people asking how they manage the CERC and, the, and how, how they manage the pricing and the answer that I kept getting was, where we set it, we set the maximum number of SERPs per person, and that's it. Some of them will set, will, will change the maximum price cap, and some won't. I kind of feel like we are the anomaly, and that we're really being aggressive and trying to make sure that we've set a budget and we're trying to stick within it. When you do that, it's time intensive. <laughs> so, uh, we, so for example, we have set a cap so that. We don't have anything beyond the 339 price, which had been the most expensive price until they added Disney content. Disney content came and it's 399 per circ in Hoopla. Interestingly, the same 95 titles that are available in Disney and Hoopla are also available in Overdrive. In Overdrive, it's 449 a circ. So who knows how this is working? But when we decided, when he was talking to us and said, we're going, everybody's going with Disney, are you going? And it's like, well, we're actually not. <laughs> we've, we've set our budget and we need to, at least this year, maintain 
within our budget. We were told we were the first and only library in Canada that was not going with it. We then talked with Vancouver Island and they were told the same thing. So it might be that we decided on exactly the same day and it was true. My experience, my experience with, the, with them in terms of the service has been good. We've gotten, they're, they're pretty responsive to feedback. Um, they make changes or not, but they, they will say that they're going to make, there have been some changes that have been good. There have been some changes that we are asking them to continue looking at. Um, that's it. So now I'm 10.03. Any questions? Michael. For stuff like the Disney, does it actually show up and then get, get a message saying, sorry, you can't have this, or is it just taken right out of the so, Yeah, so <laughs> remember I said that I, there was like lots of backhand piece of managing because I'm managing the content. If I can go in on the admin side and hide particular titles. So what I had done with Overdrive or with the Disney titles is I have, we've set a price cap that we will pay up to $3.39 per circ for our patrons. And if somebody goes in, that's one of the things that has happened is that they don't actually display, if you're, if you're searching for titles, it's not going to display and you're, they're not going to see all of the Disney titles. But if Hoopla decides to have a marquee banner ad that says Disney titles, people will click on it and get a blank page. So they don't actually see content that they can't get access to. The other issue with respect to us using, the, the not offering everything, is that when they send us the mark records, they send mark records for select titles, and we have to manually go in and delete or remove the titles so that people don't say, hey, you've got boyhood, click. No, you don't have boyhood. So <laughs> there, there's some managing pieces, and I, I, I'm willing to answer questions now or offline. I've got cards, and you guys know me. Uh, does that answer your question, yeah, yeah. kind of? Any other questions? Yeah, Alina. Exactly. So, so the question has to do with with what like are there any additional costs with Hoopla? And one of the pros about Hoopla is that there are no, are no other costs. If we launched Hoopla and nobody ever used it, it would cost us nothing for the year. So there are no hosting fees. There are no other additional fees that we're paying for. It just is per circ. But again, it's one of one of the challenges is the more we promote it, the more it's used, the more. It's costing us, <laughs> which mean, which makes it challenging on that end. And Jennifer, do you require something up front, like a bulk amount of money up front? Yes, I sorry. Yes, yes that, sorry, that's true. Thank you, Jennifer. They they do require that. I've forgotten that piece of it. They did require when we first started started to pay a certain amount of dollar, a certain amount of money. So and then, and then it was being used to credit it. A we, deposit. A, a deposit. Yeah. But we were told that if. We didn't end up having any, because we purchased our other, other titles from CVS, if we didn't end up having any Hoopla Circ and we had extra money, that we could use that deposit money for our other audiovisual titles with CVS. And then you could just pay as you go. And then you, and then you just pay, like once the deposit's done, then you just pay as you go. Thank you, I've forgotten about that piece. Alina. How more time, like out of your time, how, how much time you kind of designate for taking care of the client, checking the account, and making sure at this, so it has to do with how much of my time am I spending on this, and right now it's more than I would like. We're still, I still kind of feel we're in this working out what the heck is going on. There have been, as they make changes, sometimes they've been responsive in some ways, and in other ways we, we just have to keep on them and say, we need this to change. It's, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm doing right now is making a list of all the things that we're having to do on a regular basis. We. Uh, at, at our library, this is so counter librarian, <laughs> but it, at, we, we're, we need to manage our, our cost. So, and that's just the, we have a finite budget, we can't let it escalate. So one of the ways that we're managing it is to do review our CERC on a regular basis, pretty much weekly, looking at the really popular titles. So I meet with our collections uh, coordinators, and when we see a title, Boyhood was one that really triggered us. Um, most of the content for movies and hoopla are older content. It's like five, ten years or older. But they do <coughs> offer some new release content for about from Mongrel Media for about two months. So those will be the award winners, current titles that everybody wants to watch. Boyhood came out, and it was zero one day, and then the next like a week or two later, we had spent 
a not insignificant part of our budget <laughs> on a single title over the course of a week or two. So at that point, we started doing a regular, so we meet regular, probably about like two hours or so at my time doing reports, um, and maybe a bit of, a, of other time. Because we're wanting to, well, what we do is we go through and we say, are there other titles like Boyhood that we think are going to be really popular and going to eat up our budget that we actually have a zillion copies of on the, in physical form? And so we're sort of managing it, which is kind of where, where we, so we've got the opportunity to hide the title. So it's <laughs> bad librarian, but it's sort of being judicious with the fun. So if we've got, if we've got 17 copies in DVD that people could come and borrow, I don't want to be spending $1,000 in a week on a title that they could just come and get or that they can put on hold and get in a little while. So it is being judicious and, and looking at the funds and figuring it out. So several hours a week. Deb, I'm, I'm totally going over now, yeah. Sarah, so okay. cut me off when you need to. Yeah. No questions. No questions. Six points? No. no. Okay. No. okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you have other questions, please do feel free to contact me or talk to me afterwards. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, we're having uh, Julie from West Bend Library talk to us about uh, eMusic databases. And you're ready? I'm ready. You're ready. I'm going to sit. I'm going to sit. Um, so there's this one, and then there's two more after it, so we're almost on the talking part, as, and then we'll be on to the fun part, which is, you know, talking together. I want to thank both Jennifers, because I appreciate um, Jennifer O'Donnell's um, honesty in answering a lot of the questions. I was going to start with a disclaimer saying that anything that I say are personal opinions identified as such, and do not reflect necessarily <laughs> the opinions of the West Vancouver Memorial Library <laughs> and other boilerplate um, disclaimer um, words. Anyway, I'm going to do a sweeping uh, overview of music databases, uh, chiefly e-resources that provide music to listen to. Um, I will add that over 10 years ago, um, West Van Library received a very generous bequest that stipulated it had to be spent on music-related items. So as a result, we have been very fortunate to have a number of these products. So um, it's one of the reasons why we have a lot. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on the um, e-music, but I, I will also say I wouldn't <coughs> mind finding a sheet music database. We, from time to time, do get requests along these lines. I have not found a product or heard of a product that's available for public libraries. Um, if anyone knows of anything that's good, <laughs> not the Alexander Street sheet music. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's not fantastic, but Naxos, Naxos does it. Naxos, yeah, actually, Naxos, have you got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, because when I inquired, they said they wouldn't sell to a public library. It was for academic only. Tell them it's a memorial library. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why Deb's the deputy. <laughs> anyway, the first one I want to talk about is the Oxford Grove Music Online. Um, and um, this is available through the co-op. It is not a, da a database of downloadable or streaming music, but it's a database about music. It consists of a number of Grove dictionaries and encyclopedias of music, um, and the real kind of, I guess, showpiece is the Grove Dictionary of Music. Um, there is an <coughs> annual subscription fee for unlimited use. Um, I've, all also, I've also made notes about what the stats module is like. The stats module for Oxford products is awful. Um, uh, we had this for a number of years. Our usage started out okay and then steadily declined and we cancelled it in 2014. And quite frankly, I would not recommend it for a public library. Um, the next product I want to talk about is Freegal. It is available through the co-op. Um, their blurb says they have millions of free downloadable songs from Sony Music Canada labels from classical to bluegrass to rock and pop to new age. Um, as all of you know, uh, Freegal has a, a model that libraries hate, and I understand the feeling, where patrons download and keep music tracks. Um, basically, we're sort of giving the content away for free. It's just like giving them iTunes. Um, it's a pay-per-use pay model with a per-track fee. That's a per-song fee, not a per-album fee. Um, and then libraries can set um, the number of downloads per week. We only allow three. 
uh, and then the down, uh, it resets every Sunday evening. The search interface is horrendous. If you put in an artist name or a song title, the crap you get is unbelievable. Um, there are genre headings not done by a cataloger, I tell you. Uh, anyway, um, it does have an app, not a good interface, hard to find songs once downloaded. Having said all of that, it is loved by those who use it. And I can see, you know, we can watch the power users um, Sunday night at 9.01 p.m. You can see that they have gathered every single card in their family, all of their friends, and you can see that there are 12 downloads, you know, at 9.02 p.m. And, you know, you can just see the whole album, you know, three Simon and Garfield come for one card, three Simon and Garfield for another. You, you get the pattern. Um, we are currently not limiting um, this particular product to um, residents of the District of West Vancouver. So um, we do have, and I've just done an analysis of, of that, and because we will probably, we do not currently have Hoopla, but we'll be moving to it in the fall, um, within the next few months we will be um, cutting off non-West Vancouver residents. And that includes those librarians who may or may not be here who currently <laughs> use Freegal. So sorry. <laughs> you might want to get on the on-call list. Yeah, you might get on the on-call list, that's right. Um, the second one I want to talk about is Hoopla. Um, we, as I just mentioned, we currently do not have this product, but hope to have it by the fall sometime. Um, uh, it also has, um, sorry, my mind has gone blank. Um, it has the balance of the music catalog that Freegal doesn't. Um, and it also has spoken word, uh, e-audio and video recordings that others, Jennifer's talked about, um, and others have talked about in terms of the uh, e-audio. It is also a pay per use model, as Jennifer explained, where um, users borrow albums for a week with a per album charge, um, and then they disappear. Um, again, as Jennifer mentioned, you can set caps by either CERCs per month per patron or by a dollar amount per patron, but from what I understand, you to do that, you cannot limit patrons. So if you have a dollar amount per month, one patron could go in and use the whole thing. Um, Jennifer's talked a bit about the app. Um, I say you can use the app to access content uh, or via the website. I have not used it. Um, I have heard good things about the music content, and in fact, when you talk to their sales rep about Hoopla in general, it is the music content that they're kind of skippiest about, um, not so much their video or other offerings. They really um, push the, the music content. Is that fair, Jennifer? I think so. Yeah, okay. Um, the next product I want to talk about is the Naxos Music Library. That is, this is not available through the co-op. Um, according to their blurb, you can listen online to over one million tracks of various music genres, classical, blues, jazz, folk, and world music. As the name implies, it has the Naxos catalog of music, um, which is about 1.6 million tracks. Their stats module is okay. Um, there are three segments that we subscribe to with Naxos, the sort of overall Naxos Music Library, the Naxos Music Library Jazz, and the Naxos Spoken Word Library. You pay for each of these modules individually, and you also pay for the number of simultaneous users. So your costs, your subscription costs go up depending on how many simultaneous users you want. Um, it is a web-based player. It has an app, but it is so poor that we do not even refer patrons to it. <laughs> um, it's good for particularly for searching classical uh, music pieces, and there's a very small spoken word com um, component as well. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is Classical Music Library from Alexander Street Press. Again, it is not available through the co-op. It has over 250,000 tracks of classical music. The coverage includes music written from the earliest times to the present, including many contemporary <coughs> composers. Repertoire ranges from vocal and choral music to chamber, orchestral, solo, instrumental, and opera. Um, their stats module is not bad. Unfortunately, it lags, and so if you're trying to do monthly statistics, they're not available till the 10th of the month. So if I want to do an evaluation of what's going on in May, I can't do it till June 11th. Um, it is mostly aimed at post-secondary libraries, and it was Sarah who pointed this out to me, that actually on-site authentication is their preferred method of use, but you can work around that. Um, you pay an annual subscription, again, based on a number of simultaneous users. It is streaming music only, not mobile friendly. <laughs> 
we have found um, both this and classical, uh, pardon me, this and Naxos um, very popular, in particular with choir members in um, their attempts to learn new pieces. Um, I first heard about this when a member of the Vancouver Bach Choir contacted me because there was something wrong with classical music library, it was not working, and she was trying to learn a new piece and this is how they, they used it for learning and we, of course, used that then in advertising and told our board. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it was, she said, a number of choir members um, use these particular products to learn pieces. And that's my whirlwind tour through the databases. Um, I can answer, try to answer questions if anyone has them. Great, feel free to chat with me later if you'd like to. I need Jay and Anita to come talk to us about language learning tools. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Um, I know last year we had a ton of interest around language learning tools, and uh, we've got two library people who've done a lot of research on it in the last uh, year, and your nice pile of notes. Yes, yeah. I am doing a different approach, so I'm kind of, it's not going to be a database overview, but our process to attain that database. Okay. So, Ni hao, le de sik jo fan mea, hola, do ul, salom, anyang aseo. I've just greeted you in the, the languages that have the greatest number of speakers in Coquitlam. So you may have heard Mandarin, Cantonese, Farsi, Korean, and Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was paying attention. Um, so when we choose online learning databases, we look, we look towards those users or to those, those speakers. We like to have those languages available for learning, as well as English modules for those types of speakers. In I think it was 2011 we took the plunge with on, mm. online language learning. And the co-op sent us out a number of trials. So it was just kind of this, remember this whirlwind of trials of, of language learning databases. So we went through them. It's a little bit of a blur, but here are my impressions. Link word languages. I don't know if anybody remembers this one. This one was panned when a staff member discovered it contained poor pronunciation and some rather unpleasant memory aids involving underwear, killing, and dancing gypsies. <laughs> so we did, that was that. Uh, Live Mocha is one, it has kind of a Facebook-like interface, almost kind of a social media component. Uh, it, I found it rather to be complicated to use. I think maybe better for younger people. Um, it's affiliated with Rosetta Stone. It didn't contain Cantonese or Farsi, so. That one didn't get, didn't make it. Then we trialed rocket languages, it included 32 languages, only one Chinese and no Farsi. And then finally, the other, the, the last also ran was Rosetta Stone, and I know that's the Rolls Royce of language learning, but I expect that's partly due to good branding. I did enjoy the trial. Trying to learn Tagalog was like a deep tissue massage for my brain. <laughs> Unfortunately, it did not contain all our major languages, no Cantonese, no Farsi. Surrey has said that they found, they found that it was probably too academic for their patrons, and I would probably have to say the same thing, although I did, my brain did really like it. <laughs> so what we did end up going with a little while back was Mango Languages. Platform is very nice, easy to use. There's a little bit of... Um, like you have to kind of use your brain to figure it out a little bit, which is nice rather than just kind of mindless repetition of, of words. Uh, one of its drawbacks, however, is that it did not contain an English module for Farsi speakers, though we asked them about it and they said they were considering it. <laughs> it and I checked just before doing this, it's still not there, so. Um, and not especially cheap. It, it cost us over $5,000 a year. I did get good in, good usage initially and then declined over time. Has app for Apple and Android, which I think are better on a phone than on a tablet. 
We also subscribed around the same time as Mango to Muzzy, which is a children's language learning database, possibly one of the only ones. I was not in love with it from the start. Uh, it seemed a bit primitive and childish, and I've learned recently that it was based on a, a 1986 BBC film for language learning. <laughs> so it, it had a whole story in it. But, but when you looked at the database, you, and unless you were aware of that, you had really no idea. And, and the characters were presented as if you should know who they were. <laughs> so it was unclear. And then again, with, with language learning in children, I think it's important to sometimes be able to see the mouth, like the actual mouth, rather than just like cartoons, you know, so anyway, we did have it for about a year and then we cancelled it. And, and recently we made this, this switch to Vernunciator. It contains all our major language groups and English lessons for them all, so our Farsi speakers are, are pleased with that. Um, <coughs> the interface can dis display in a number of languages as well. It's a fraction of the cost of Mango. It is a bit clunky looking after you've had sort of the smoothness of, of Mango, but it, it seems to be working okay. We're getting good usage. The stats is a little bit light for it. It also has an app for Android and Apple. And if there are any questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I need us on. Sir, will you keep yes. both Mango and Fernandez? No, we, we ditched your... Mango, and now we just have Fernandez. Okay. Okay. No clap, no clap. <laughs> to choosing a database and how we got to what we chose and why. Um, the story started from when our language uh, database was going to come to its subscription end, uh, which was uh, PowerSpeak, which is a Gale product. And we discovered that uh, it was hugely expensive. Also that there were no intentions by Gale to offer it in, in an app form. So um, this set us on the uh, track to find a replacement. And uh, I just want to point out that all this work uh, and choice and trial and evaluation was done by my colleague, Karen Liebel, who has moved on to a different department. Um, so I'm just delivering 
per uh, result. <laughs> 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 um, so what my role has been to make this report look pretty. So, <laughs> so these are the, the three databases that we tested. <coughs> Pronunciator, Rosetta Stone, and Transparent Language, which is one that, Jay, you didn't look at, I guess. Um, we may have, but I, I knew that you were going to be talking about it. <laughs> I didn't have a lot to say about it. So I no, I, I but, OK. Um, so what we did was, or what Karen organized, um, because we are a large group of librarians and often have trouble actually getting together or finding time during the day to trial some of these databases. It was Karen's idea that uh, time be set aside in our language, uh, in, in, our, in our lab, for people to sit down and actually look at all three and do an evaluation, which proved to be quite successful in collecting the data that would lead to the decision. So this is the next a little bit here is an overview of uh, what was a synopsis of the options and what was offered. And you can see actually our choice was pronunciator uh, because it offered more languages, more mobile applications, and it was half the cost of power speed. Rosetta Stone was way out of our reach and transparent. I'm not quite sure what happened with that. Um, but one of the driving factors was the, the mobile options. Because if you're traveling and you want to refer to how to say hello in Greek, for example, uh, you can do that with uh, power to speed. So just briefly, uh, here are some of the, um, the strengths of Pronunciator. It's easy to navigate, good, good mix of reading, writing, listening and speaking components. Um, there's movies, poetry, music, pictures as part of it. I did find it also clunky having tried it myself. However, none of these are perfect. Um, we did have a patron actually email us with a concern that it was too simple. Uh, it depends on how you're looking at it. As a language major myself, I, th I think it's actually simple. So I, that could be a good or bad thing. And as for staff feedback, love this database. I'm sure will improve as they age. <laughs> of the three, I preferred this one. After testing Rosetta and Transparent, I'm completely giddy at this product. I find it hard to come up with any cons. Um, and that's basically about it. Um, I'm happy to forward uh, this report uh, to whomever wants. Um, and just to follow up on this, what our department, Digital Services, does is we, we take care of seeking out new products, negotiating contracts with vendors, um, getting the best price. And once that a report has actually been formalized, that goes to actually a committee of about 12 librarians. It's our collections management committee. And the decision of whether we're going to subscribe to any particular database is done by that committee. So it's, a lot of people evaluate it. Um, and that's about it. Am I, I think I made it. <laughs> How long have you been using that? About a, a year? Since or January. Since January. Yeah. So and it's the usage relatively has been good? I'm not quite sure about the usage, but um, sorry I didn't look into that, but if you're curious, we can, yeah. we can send you usage stats. I have a question for either Jay or Anita, and that is about um, language learning e-resources that are particularly for ESL students, things like Road to IELTS or anything like that, if anyone has those. 
or any other type of product? I know we're I, sort of in the market for something. I think, and I'm not sure, I think Transparent had that. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm just going by memory, which has been, you know, like a year ago. So, yeah, you might want to check that out. I don't know nothing about any of that stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll look out for it. Okay. I do, actually. Okay. We do have them, but they're still the old product that we see you on. Okay. That are loaded on to Okay. Yeah. No, one of these does, but I, I you know, I'm not quite sure. We'll be recording on it next year. Yeah. <laughs> And our last quick section of this part is about MOOCs, and then there'll be another break for coffee and to eat the rest of those um, bagels, because they all have to be eaten, uh, so you guys are responsible for that. And then we'll move into the breakout session. So um, Jennifer's going to talk to us about MOOCs, and I'll close this down. So as Anita prefaced her session about saying that she was presenting Karen's research, I am presenting information that I have not actually implemented, but I have gathered. So I'm willing to take feedback from people who are more aware of it. <laughs> Last year at the eBook Summit, there were uh, Gill courses or Learn for Life as it was known then, was just approaching libraries and the possibility of doing programming with MOOCs. BPL was just starting it and there was excitement. So we thought that at the summit that we wanted to provide an update on what has been happening with that. Some libraries have done a lot of thinking but haven't moved forward yet. I contacted a number of libraries and the only two that I found that were doing something in terms of programming with MOOCs were VPL and North Bend District, which is where I am. Vancouver Public Library has uh, Gale Courses, which is a paid subscription model uh, module and they offer, they've offered about five or six programs, I think, that have been focused on those courses. They have also offered courses or programs associated with Coursera, Sailor.org, and Open to Study MOOCs, which are open, free MOOCs that are available. The way that they structure their courses is they're about four to six weeks. They meet weekly. The, they have registration about 10, although they found that that's not quite enough, so they tend to open it up and have about 15 to 20 and have it be a bit more unlimited. They've found reasonably good success, but what they're focusing on right now is, oh, I forget the phrase that Renee used, <laughs> sort of like looking at it from the back end, like how do we actually promote just the idea of e-learning? Um, so they're looking at courses of like introductions to e-learning and um, how are they gonna market it and do promotion? Does that kind of, in a, in a minute or less, summarize <laughs> what you guys are doing? Uh, and so that's, that's Vancouver's perspective. Uh, my interpretation of Vancouver's perspective. <laughs> now, for North Bend District, we were thinking of doing a pilot project uh, for MOOCs, and we were sort of taking a bit of what we'd heard that BPL had done, and my colleague Paul actually has st started a program that seems to be really successful. We've had a discussion group, which was just an organic, it was a monthly, monthly program that ran at but the Parkgate branch, where people could come and just have conversations about whatever they wanted to talk about. And they raised it in that conversation of why don't we run this MOOC. So they collectively decided upon a MOOC. So they researched different um, MOOCs that were available from edX and Coursera. And they decided on the course that they thought would be the most stimulating content. So there were some courses they thought might pro that might prompt better discussions, but this was content that would be really interesting. They launched it in a way, so it's they meet every two weeks, so it's, it's a bi-weekly, every two weeks they meet. There was registration, and the registration was through our, both so that we had a sense of numbers, and also so that we could help make sure that they were registering with the Coursera as well, so that if we needed to make copies of any materials, we weren't violating copyright because they were actually registered in the course. So they meet every two weeks. There are about 20 people or so who are registered, but only about 12 or 14 people attend every other week, or each each session, about 12 to 14, which actually works out to be a really good number for the for the discussion. It's about a nine-month program, so we're about halfway, just over about halfway through, and it's really popular. The people are the people are really wanting to continue, and they're they're looking at the possibility of what the course could be for next year, and they're also looking at possibly doing this course at other branches, just because it's, it's offered a lot of good, good learning opportunity. 
Some people, if they're really committed, can actually fulfill and continue the full value of the MOOC and at, offline, so if they miss a session, they can learn it. But other, otherwise, they can just show up. Um, the, the way that it works at North Van, for each of their meetings, they, they review the video piece, so it's a series, this particular course that they've selected has videos that are about six to 10 minutes, so they'll watch a video and then they'll answer the questions and they'll have a discussion about the questions and how are they going to answer them, and then they'll watch the next video and sort of like repeat for the whole time. So anyways, it's been very successful, and congratulations to Paul and, and BPL. Any questions about MOOCs that I could answer or I could facilitate? Jennifer. Jay. What, what, what is your MOOC about? What is your MOOC about? What's the Our MOOC was Introduction to Philosophy. Okay. So it's, it's an introduction to philosophy. I think the first several courses were what were, were kind of, they were required, but they were they sort of set up the basis. How do you create an argument? How do you, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. How, how do you create what an argument? What is an argument? Right. What is an argument? What is an valid argument? What is a sound argument? Um, premises and premises and conclusions and so forth. That, those were, those, that was covered in the first couple of lectures. Other than that, the free will stand alone. And so I actually sort of bought for patrons to come in as guests. And so I try to fill out numbers if I know that regulars are not attending so we can get a good group, at least expose people to, to the content. It's actually proved to be hazardous. With the, we, did, we, we had a couple of guests who were a little bit disturbed by the brain in the back um, <laughs> module we were, we were doing. But no, but it's been really successful. And it's, it, you, can skip, you can skip sessions and really not have to catch up on the content in order to continue and really get a lot of it. Right. Thank you. That's Paul. He's coordinating at Parkgate. Uh, at, at Vancouver, their most successful module has been on gardening. And it's with the, with the Coursera course. It's their gardening course. And I think they've run it at, at Central and they've run it at Renfrew. And it's been doing really well. Um, but they're also now looking at the possibility of creating hybrid learning. So instead of actually having the Coursera course or the Gill Courses course, which is really expensive because gardening is a very local piece. What if we were wanting to say, okay, well, this library is interested in having a hybrid learning opportunity, and you like say, if there's several library systems that are interested, maybe we could coordinate something. That's I don't know whether that's real or whether that's just a pie in the sky, but it's a possibility. <laughs> I know that we're <coughs> one minute before break, so is there another quick question about MOOCs? Yeah. We did something interesting. In we had staff who wanted to learn Python and as part of their sort of annual professional development. So we signed up for a Coursera Introduction to Computer Programming Python course and then opened it up to the public. And it was very last minute, it was just social media. I think we had 20 people show up to the first one. And now the numbers dropped off because the they realized like this is actually computer programming. Um, <laughs> but it was still, you know, as a, just even just as a kind of getting a temperature check um, on, on the level of interest in a subject like that, it was really interesting to know some people in the library don't necessarily want to see, and some of them did continue. Yeah. So, um, and we were doing it anyway, so it just kind of opened that up to... And I think opening up the idea of what e-learning is, I know that at North Bend District, before we had done our program, we'd had a, what is a MOOC? What is e-learning? So we'd done sessions along that as we were selecting the course, and, and that's what I think I understand BPL is doing. So even as facilitators of that, and as Deb was saying, saying, hey, this is what we're doing, they can sort of pop in. There was a quick quick question back. We have about oh, 20 I seconds. Just I was just going to point out that one of the things that BPL did this year was have one of the student librarians uh, actually develop a course called Introduction to E-Learning. portion of the session. Before I let you go grab the rest of the uh, fruit and bagels and coffee, we're going to use the front five tables for our breakout discussions. So there'll be five different discussion topics and I will be volunteering people to run each one in the next couple minutes. And um, then we'll have a chance to go up and talk about our findings after about 20 minutes of discussion. And then we'll go back and do another five topics. So there are a variety of topics. If you have one, that you really burningly want to talk about, come see me at the front table here. Otherwise, you have about uh, 10 minutes to have coffee and snacks before we distribute to these tables. Thank you.